welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm filming on a Friday uh, because I've had quite a busy week and do, I've had lots of meetings. I had um, an online book club on Wednesday and then I had group yesterday, an autism group I go to. So it's been quite a busy week just with one thing and another. So um, I, w I thought I'd do it today instead. Um, I have got one bit of news to tell you before I get on to the book I want to review today. Um, not that long ago, um, I, t I did a pod, I was on um, um, Thoughty Orty, I don't know if any of you have heard of a Thoughty Orty podcast, um, I'll put a link in the box below, um, but as per, as, as Thoughty Orty is a podcast um, hosted by um, Asperger's Growth, that's the channel name, um, which you can find on YouTube if you type in Asperger's Growth. And then look at the videos on there and you'll find the Thoughty Orty podcast. And it's hosted by a young man called Thomas, um, who's autistic from the UK. He lives up north um, in the UK. And, um, yeah, so he's autistic and he's got this, um, uh, he, he, he hosts the Thoughty Orty podcast where he interviews uh, different autistic people. And um, I've been following his channel for quite some time. Um, and... Um, he put out. He, he said to people who were, he he suggested that people who were interested um, get in contact with him, email him um, if they wanted to take part in the channel and hit on his podcast. So I sent him an email, and um, he got back quite quickly. In fact, and um, yeah, and I was on his podcast, um, and it's. Um, I think I'd have to double check. Um, because I've already viewed the podcast myself because he sent me a yet privately, so I had to look through it myself. Um, I think it's up, it, if it isn't up live now, it will be up live very soon. Because um, I, I still need to check. I've been a bit behind on things lately. So it might already be up there, but if, if it isn't yet on, up there, it will be very soon. Um, so yeah, so that was really cool. So do go and check out his channel. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good channel, so do go and check that one out. And... Um, You'll find my podcast on there and the other podcasts that we have done. Okay, so now I'm going to get on to the book that I want to review today. Um, the book is Autism and Asperger Syndrome in Children by Dr. Luke Bearden. Now, Dr. Luke Bearden, um, he's quite well known in the autism community. Uh, he's a um, uh, he's not a clinician, but he um, he, he educates, he's an educator, um, a lecturer, I think at the University of Sheffield, um, and he, he, ed, he um, lectures people, trains people in autism and things like that, so he's more kind of like psychology based, he's not a clinician though, um, and I read this book a little while back, um, obviously it's not aimed at my age group, it's, it's aimed at, well it's aimed at parents, yeah it's aimed at my age group, but it's aimed at parents, and obviously I'm not a parent, but it's aimed at parents who have um, autistic children or children who might be autistic and are going through the process of assessment. So I just read it just because I was curious more than anything because I'd read his book on um, autism and adults so I just wanted to read his book on children. I think his book in autism and adults is better but that's only because it's more obviously more relevant because it's more targeted at my sort of age range. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to go through some of the things in here that sort of stood out for me really or um, and my thoughts on it. Um, so one thing I do like about Luke Bearden, he, in a way he's quite kind of a avant-garde in a sense that he kind of questions and critiques quite a range of uh, established autism theories that he, um, he argues are uh, pernicious and in a sense that they encourage stereotypes and um, don't help autistic people in the world, they encourage people, autistic people to be judged in a rather negative light. So he's quite avant-garde in his kind of, um, I, he's very, I guess he's very much behind the neurodiversity movement and I have talked as well about my thoughts on that and how, um, whilst, so, while I do agree with some parts of the neurodiversity movement, I think are really quite um, good. Um, other areas I'm not so, I'm, I'm a little bit more like sceptical of, but that's a different subject. But anyway, one thing that I do agree with him, though, is that he says that we should avoid... He's, he's very against the term neurotypical because um, of the negative connotations of typical. Um, 
And so he's, which actually, when you think about it, makes sense because neurotyp, I mean, after all, typical is essentially a synonym for normal. So it's almost like saying neuronormal with neurotypical. Like, he, he's, so he says for a more neutral um, appellation for, um, for describing people who aren't autistic would be the predominant neurotype because that's more neutral. It's simply saying that they're like, the majority, and it's just, it's a, it is a true, you know, the majority of people are not autistic, the majority of people are not um, disadvantaged by their neurology, because if they were, you know, society wouldn't be functioning as it is. So he says, you know, that instead of calling them neurotypical, which has, is kind of, which is loaded with, you know, assumptions, instead, predominant neurotype simply says what, what it does on the tip, in a sense, you know. It's straightforward, predominant neurotype. I'd agree. I think that's a good thing, actually. Let me know what you think. Um, he does, um, on, on page four of the book, he talks about um, the issue of parents who have a newly diagnosed child, autistic child, um, who often go into mourning, mourning um, because they often think, you know, what could have been? Why, why is their child autistic? Um, and they can end up going into mourning over it. And Luke Beard, and, and I do disagree with Luke Beard in here actually, because he does, he seems to be quite critical of that. And he says, for example, I don't read stories of parents or PNT children suddenly bemoaning that the child isn't showing autism signs. Oh, my poor child, she isn't autistic. Well, obviously not, because autism is a disability, lest we not forget. Um, I do disagree with Luke Bearden here. I can see where he's coming from, <laughs> in the sense that... Yeah, I can see where he's coming from, but, and a big but, if... I mean, I'm not a parent, so I can't really understand what it's like to be a parent. But I can imagine that if you're, if you're someone, say, who has a child who turns out to be autistic and you're a parent who's had all these hopes for the child, you know, you, you, you don't like to see your child struggling. You wouldn't like to see your child struggling, you know, not being able to make friends, um, maybe being behind at school in certain areas of learning. That's going to be really difficult if you're a parent and you want the best for your child. So, obviously, I can understand, actually, why... A parent, particularly if a child is like more classically autistic, but I mean for all types of autism actually, but particularly if a child is like really quite disabled by it, I can understand why a parent might actually go into mourning. And I don't see that as a bad or a negative thing. It, I, I don't see it like that. And I sort of feel in a way that is a bit unfair of Luke Bearden to kind of have a go. It almost feels like he's having a bit of a go at parents for that. And that's what I don't like about certain elements of the neurodiversity movement, is that I feel they can be slightly critical of parents mourning for their child. And I don't understand why they're being critical. It seems a bit mean and a bit unfair, if you ask me, because I, I can, I, for me, it's perfectly understandable. It doesn't mean that the parent is having a go at autism or is critical of autistic people. They simply want the best for their child. And if a child doesn't turn out in some way, it's going to be quite natural that a parent's going to feel a sense of loss. And that to me is quite understandable, even though I'm not a parent, I can understand that process. So yeah, I do feel that's a little bit critical, <laughs> and I disagree with Luke Bidden there, it's a bit harsh if you ask me. Um, yeah, he also argues that, uh, the pro he says the problems often arise from society, not from the autistic. Um, yeah, I can see where he's coming from, obviously a lot of problems that you experience as an autistic person can be caused by society can be caused by the fact that society isn't very accommodating of neurological differences is not set up in a way that can accommodate autistic people and that obviously then can cause a lot of problems um, so I do understand where he's coming from there but at the same time I would say that also some of the problems do actually come from being autistic <laughs> regardless of the society that you were to live in so he is obviously very critical of a medical model and, um, and I can see why it's critical of a medical model. The medical model in its pure state, in its extreme state, has caused a lot of damage by putting all, pinning all the problems on the person with the issue and where society and it's like, or feels it's like off a hook and doesn't feel like it has to do anything. But um, to say that it's all society seems to me also a bit extreme. It's like you need a balanced approach. Um, he talks about the golden equation 
and this this is this is kind of this is Dr. Luke Bearden's kind of favourite thing. He often talks about it. Autism plus environment equals outcome. Autism plus environment equals outcome. Um, and then he says that leads on to what he calls the golden concept. That what works for the PNT, the predominant neurotype, is likely to work for autistic. For example, look at me when I'm talking to you. Um, look at me when I'm talking to you because the teacher believes that looking equals attention. But with autism, you cannot, you cannot hear a word the teacher is saying if you're made to look because you, can't, you often can't look and listen at the same time. So um, I agree with Luke there, definitely. Um, I struggle with eye contact um, because I do find it hard to kind of take in multiple streams of information and I find eye contact really distracting. And then obviously someone might think I'm not listening to them or maybe that I'm being a bit shifty when actually it's the complete opposite. I'm trying to listen to what they're saying. I want to hear what they're saying. But it's too much to both look at them and try and process at the same time. So I agree with Luke there. Um, certainly the environment that you're placed in is obviously going to affect the outcome. You know, it's going to either exacerbate an autistic person's problems or massively reduce them. Um, obviously it depends... To the extent of that reduction obviously depends on the nature of a person's original disability in the first place. Um, or I should say impairment, to be more sociologically exact, because a disability is when is the, is the um, is to do with impairment plus environment, isn't it? Um, according to the social model. Um, but yeah, the original impairment, so what you originally come into the world with, if you like, um, the extent of that impairment is then obviously going to uh, have a big role to play in terms of how much the environment can reduce the impact or not. But certainly, no matter no matter what the extent of the impairment, if you have a good environment tailored to that person's needs, then obviously that person's going to do a lot better and is certainly going to reach their potential and be less disabled um, than, say, if the environment was really bad or wasn't taking into account their needs. So I do agree with Luke Fair. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to move on to video number two now to carry on reviewing autism and Asperger's syndrome in children by Dr. Luke Bearden. So moving on to video number two now.